So today I'm soaking up the atmosphere of Pall Mall Clubland and St James because that's where the story of the Riddle of the Sand starts. Um, I've got it here. So I thought I'd read this bit now to inspire me to get out there. At seven o'clock in the evening of 23rd of September, I was making my evening toilet in my chambers in Pall Mall. Well, unfortunately, I'm not a member of a Pall Mall club, so couldn't make my toilet. Um, who is Carruthers? A young man of condition and fashion, who knows the right people, belongs to the right clubs, has a safe, possibly a brilliant future in the Foreign Office, may be excused for a sense of complacent martyrdom, when in his keen appreciation of the social calendar, he is doomed to the outer solitude of London in September. I think we've all felt that. I say martyrdom, but in fact the case was infinitely worse. For to feel oneself a martyr, as everybody knows, is a pleasurable thing. And the true tragedy of my position was that I had passed that stage. I had enjoyed what sweets it had to offer in ever dwindling degree since the middle of August, when ties were still fresh and sympathy abundant. I had been conscious that I was missed at Morven Lodge party. Lady Ashley herself had said so in the kindest possible manner when she wrote to acknowledge the letter in which I explained with an effectively austere reserve of language that circumstances compelled me to remain at my office. We know how busy you must be just now, she wrote, and I do hope you won't overwork. We shall all miss you very much. Friend after friend got away to sport and fresh air with promises to write and chafing condolences, and as each deserted the sinking ship, I took a grim delight in my misery, positively almost enjoying the first week or two after my world had been finally dissipated to the four bracing winds of heaven. So that's where we find Carruthers at the beginning. By the first week in September I had abandoned all palliatives and had settled into the dismal but dignified routine of office, club and chambers. But the plain truth was that my work was neither interesting nor important and consisted chiefly at present in smoking cigarettes, in saying that Mr So-and-so was away and would be back about 1st of October, in being absent for lunch from 12 till 2, and in my spare moments making precy of, let us say, the less confidential consular reports and squeezing the results into cast-iron schedules. Only one thing was needed to fill my cup of bitterness, and this was that specially occupied me as I dressed for dinner this evening. Two days more in this dead and fermenting city and my slavery would be at an end. Yes, but irony of ironies, I had nowhere to go to. Perfect. And here's what happens. The usual preliminary scuffle on the staircase prepared me for the knock and entry of Withers. Withers demurely handed me a letter bearing a German postmark and marked urgent. I had just finished dressing and was collecting my money and gloves. A momentary thrill of curiosity broke in upon my depression as I sat down to open it. A corner on the reverse of the envelope bore the blotted legend, very sorry, but there's one other thing. A pair of rigging screws from Carey and Nielsen, size one and three eighths, galvanized. Here is the letter. From Yacht Dulcibella, Flensburg, Schleswig-Holstein, 21st of September. Dear Carruthers, I dare say you'll be surprised at hearing from me, as it's ages since we met. It is more than likely, too, that what I'm going to suggest won't suit you, for I know nothing of your plans, and if you're in town at all, you're probably just getting into harness again and can't get away. So I merely write on the off chance to ask if you would care to come out here and join me in a little yachting, and I hope duck shooting. I know you're keen on shooting, and I sort of remember that you have done some yachting, too, though I rather forget about that. This part of the Baltic, the Schleswig Fjords, is a splendid cruising ground, A1 scenery, and there ought to be plenty of duck about soon if it gets cold enough. I came out here via Holland and the Frisian Islands starting early in August. My pals have had to leave me and I'm badly in want of another, as I don't want to lay up yet for a bit. I needn't say how glad I should be if you could come. If you can, send me a wire to the PO here. Flushing and on by Hamburg will be your best route, I think. I'm having a few repairs done here, and we'll have them ready sharp by the time your train arrives. Bring your gun and a good lot of number fours, and would you mind calling at Lancaster's and asking for mine and bringing it too? Bring some oil skins, better get the eleven shilling sort, jacket and trousers, not the yachting brand, and if you paint, bring your gear. I know you speak German like a native, and that will be a great help. Forgive this hail of directions, but I have a sort of feeling that I'm in luck and that you'll come. 
Anyway, I hope you and the FO both flourish. Goodbye, yours ever, Arthur H. Davis. And would you mind bringing me out a prismatic compass and a pound of raven mixture? This letter marked an epoch for me, but I little suspected the fact as I crumbled it into my pocket and started languidly on the voie de la Rose, which I nightly followed to the club. In Pall Mall, there were no dignified greetings to be exchanged now with well-groomed acquaintances. The only people to be seen were some late stragglers from the park, with a perambulator and some hot and dusty children lagging fretfully, some behind. rustic sightseers draining the last dregs of the daylight in an effort to make out from their guidebooks which of these reverend piles of policemen and a builder's cart. Of course, the club was a, was a strange one, both of my own being closed for cleaning, a coincidence expressly planned by Providence for my inconvenience. The club which you are permitted to make use of on these occasions always irritates with its strangeness and discomfort, and the few occupants seem odd and oddly dressed, and you wonder how they got there. The particular there. weekly that you want is not taken in, the dinner is execrable, and the ventilation a farce. All these evils oppressed me tonight, and yet I was puzzled to find that somewhere within me there was a faint lightening of the spirits, causeless as far as I could discover. It could not be Davis's letter. Yachting in the Baltic at the end of September, the very idea made one shudder. Cows, with a pleasant party and hotels handy, was all very well. An August cruise on a steam yacht in French waters or the islands, all very well. What kind of a yacht was this? It must be of a certain size to have got so far. But I thought I remembered enough of Davis's means to know that he had no money to waste on luxuries. Hmm. After the wreck of my pleasant plans and the fiasco of my martyrdom, to be asked as a consolation to spend October freezing in the Balting with an eccentric non-entity who bored me. God. Yet. As I smoked my cigar in the ghastly splendour of the empty smoking room, the subject came up again. Was there anything in it? There were certainly no alternatives at hand. And to bury myself in the Baltic at this unearthly time of year had at least a smack of tragic thoroughness about it. I pulled out the letter again and ran down its impulsive staccato sentences, affecting to ignore what a gust of fresh air, high spirits and good fellowship this flimsy bit of paper wafted into the jaded club room. On reperusal, it was full of evil presage. A1 scenery. But what are the equinoctial noctial storms and October fogs? Every sane yachtsman was paying off his crew now. There ought to be duck. Vague, very vague. If it gets cold enough. Cold and yachting seemed to be a gratuitously monstrous union. His pals had left him. Why? Not the yachting brand, and why not? As to the size, comfort and crew of the yacht, all cheerfully ignored. So many maddening blanks. And by the way, why in heaven name, heaven's name a prismatic compass? I fingered a few magazines. Played a game of fifty with a friendly old fogey, too importunate to be worth the labour of resisting, and went back to my chambers to bed. Ignorant that a friendly providence had come to my rescue.